Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Dr. Wilcox, the Community Coordinator at the New Jersey Healthcare Quality Institute. The Quality Institute is a nonprofit, multi-stakeholder advocate for the safety, quality, and affordability of healthcare for everyone. The Quality Institute oversees a statewide community health initiative called Conversation of Your Life, also known as COIL, which is a program of our Mayor's Wellness Campaign. COIL aims to engage communities and residents in crucial advanced care planning conversations. We discuss topics like how to communicate your wishes to your loved ones and healthcare providers, hospice and palliative care, and various advanced directive documents. Our programming is being adapted to various cultures and languages. Now, we don't know when a medical emergency or a public health crisis is going to occur. And the COVID-19 pandemic has prompted many people to consider the advanced care directives they may have been putting off. And we wanna make sure that you guys have all the information and resources that you need to make decisions about the type of care that you want. We're going to continue to provide resources and have these crucial conversations remotely through digital resources, podcasts, and webinars like this one here today. Before we begin, I just wanted to cover a couple of housekeeping items. Please be sure, please know that this webinar is being recorded and a copy will be posted to our website, www.njhcqi.org later today. All phone lines will be muted for the duration of the program to limit background noise. And you may ask questions at the end of the presentation by typing into the chat box. The topic for today's presentation is your caregiver relationship contract. Please be advised that it is not the intent of this program or its speakers to provide clinical or legal advice. Today, we're honored to have Deborah Halsey, founder of Advocate for Mom and Dad, joining us for today's presentation. After a brief introduction, we'll have a presentation followed by an audience Q&A session. So Deb, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Super, thank you so much for, um, for asking me to join you. Um, so this is all about how to have what I call an intentional conversation, um, particularly a, an intentional conversation uh, of your life. Dapa, I'll let you go to the next slide. So I'm gonna give you a moment to read this. This is one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite caregiving thought leaders, a woman by the name of Ann Tomlinson who founded daughterhood.org. So here's the thing, I'm a caregiver. You may or may not be, but as Rosalind Carter said, you either were, will be, um, are, or will need one. And so as caregivers, I find we also often worry about being perfect. We will put off making the decision because we fear it's not the right one. We'll put off having a conversation about a difficult subject, like asking our loved one what they want for end of life, because either we don't know how to start it, or we're not sure how our loved one is gonna react. I'm gonna tell you through this next 40 minutes that I know from personal experience that having the conversation in your life is an incredible relief. And it really turned out to be one of the ultimate acts of self-care we give ourselves because you don't need to feel guilty or remorse at the end of life. Dapa, next slide, please. So this is from my mom and dad's 60th wedding anniversary. And that next year, my father was diagnosed with congestive heart failure and I began going to the doctor's appointments with him. And since he was mom's caregiver, I began to take an even more active role in their life. And, and they live about, an hour away from me in my family home. And I was a caregiver at that point, but I didn't identify as one. And there's a real difference between my parents and how they approach things. Years before he came ill, my dad went with, went with me when I put my beloved first dog down as support. And when we walked away, he said to me, we treat our animals better than we treat humans. And it was the first of many conversations about how my father wanted to live out his days. That year that my father was diagnosed with a congestive heart failure, he made sure to know where I, know where 
that I knew where to find his five wishes documents, the spreadsheet with all his pass pa passwords, and that I was named for SSPOA for finances. My mom, on the other hand, had no desire to have any conversation about what she wanted about end of life, even if she got sick. I don't know. My mom is Italian, so for her, you just don't have those conversations for fear that you would call an Ill illness into your life. In fact, mom wasn't big on any types of life altering conversations. One time I asked my parents they wanted to stay in their home before dad could say anything, mom declared, the only way I'm leaving this house is feet first. And so dad and I just kind of shrugged our shoulders. Next slide. So this is my dad in the hospital. Um, he went in November of 2014. Um, and for the first few days, I didn't think he's gonna make it. There's a story about the POA for finances not being signed that I'm gonna save for another time. But let me just say my one bit of advice to you is make sure you see the documentation, all the legal documentation before it's needed. Dad was in the hospital for, th for two weeks. We had the holidays with him and mom's birthday, but I could tell he was getting tired of fighting. And in February of 2015, I got the call, call that dad was back in the hospital and I flew home. And I spent most of that week with him, asking family and friends to be with mom. And I actually felt he was stable. And I was driving back to my house um, on a Saturday because I needed a haircut desperately when his cardiologist called. And he called to say that dad had made the decision to turn off his defibrillator. And my heart dropped. I asked when, and he said tomorrow, to allow my brother and sister-in-law to come up from North Carolina to New Jersey. And we were all with my father when he died. We got to say everything we needed to, and there was comfort for me in knowing that it was his decision and he was at peace with it. And I am so grateful that no one else in the family had to make the most difficult of decisions. It was the last gift he gave to us by him deciding to turn off the defibrillator. We were lucky. For many people, their loved one is so ill that they cannot weigh into that and, they, and you have to make the decision for them. Uh, Dapa, you can go to the next slide. So here's the thing. I'm gonna share some caregiving stories because the one truth I know and I've learned over the last seven years is that life changes for everyone when you become a caregiver and someone needs a caregiver. And one of the biggest lessons that I learned is that there are communication tools to have conversations whether you're a spouse or a child or a friend. Um, and you have to have those difficult conversations because life really does change on so many levels. When my dad died, my, lost, my mother lost her best friend of 67 years, her husband of 62, and her caregiver. Now, my life changed because when I became my mom's caregiver, I lost my job due to caregiving issues. And frankly, my life is still not recovered because it's on hold. I really can't plan for retirement and I where I'm going to do that. And I don't have the freedom to come and go and I, as I please. And my to-do list running two households, my mom and I is never ending. We also need to recognize that all of these changes are incredibly emotional, both for you and the person that you're caring for and everyone else in your family as well. Caregiving is such an emotional journey. It really, really is. Um, yeah, you'll find that out if you don't already know. Dapa, next slide, please. So I also want to reassure you that all those emotions that you are feeling if you're a caregiver and I'm feeling is absolutely perfectly normal. Um, and the other thing is that these emotions are going to hit you in times you don't expect it. I will share with you that when my dad died, my mother was beyond herself. 
And so my focus was on her, getting her through this time. And I never had time to grieve. One day, I walked into a Hallmark store to buy a card. This is probably three months after my dad died. And I burst into tears and had a walk out. Because for the first time, I realized I would never buy him a car and card again. And he was really gone. Okay. And so you just have to go with the emotions, no matter what they are, anger, resentment, frustration. And trust me, when you start to have difficult conversations with your loved one, those emotions are going to bubble to the top as well. Here's the thing I've learned is that we have history with a person we're caring for and history within our families. And that history plays a huge part in what I call knee jerk emotions, right? It's that move to a quick emotion, whether it's appropriate or not, because it's like a knee jerk to something somebody said or did. And we must recognize the truth of this before we can have productive, intentional conversations. The other thing is in terms of family history, if you never felt heard or respected in the family, then you're gonna bring those emotions to difficult conversations as well. Probably one of the biggest and hardest lessons I had to learn is not only accepting those emotions, but actually embracing them. And by that, I mean, you need to claim them and change them. Sorry, you need to name the emotion and claim it. And that's only after that can you change it. And that knee-jerk emotion, I call my inner eight-year-old. And I'm being really serious about this. When I feel the back of the hair on my neck going up when my mother asks me to do something, I have to stop and ask myself, is this an ask or a demand? Because if it's a demand, then I might respond differently. But if it's an ask and my knee-jerk emotion is to hear it as a demand, then that's not an appropriate emotion. And when my inner eight-year-old, that rebellious child bubbles to the top, I know it's time to walk away from the conversation and come back to it later. And that's gonna play into having an intentional conversation. I will also tell you that that inner eight-year-old in dealing with emotions holds true for setting boundaries as well, which is another topic for a different time. Dapa, would you move to the next slide for me? So here's the other thing I've learned. Don't live in your head. And I've learned it actually watching my mom, right? So, so I'm, I'm just curious, if you feel comfortable in the Q&A, do you ever have complete conversations and fights in your head with other people? I do. If you do and you're brave enough, go ahead and put a yes or a no in the chat, right? Complete conversations and have fights in your head with other people before you even have the conversation. Here's the thing, you're making up the script. So every response that you assign to that other person at least for me, just makes me angrier or angrier and more resentful and it's insanity. And so if you find yourself having this inner dialogue where you're getting angrier and angrier and the person's not even part of the conversation, we have to learn to refocus our thoughts and our inner dialogues. I'll give you a fun story and this is a true one. And this worked for me. So I, I remind myself of this and think, what can I do? At one point in my career, I had to drive an hour to work. And I was furious with my boss over something. I don't even remember what it was. I cannot for the life of me remember, remember why I was angry. But that entire drive, I just stewed about it. And when I got to work, I was cranky and out of sorts, which is really not a good way to start your day. And then all of a sudden, I had this aha moment and I thought, this situation is and person are taking up too much real estate in my head. I've got to focus on something else. And that thought, when I find myself 
you know, obsessing about something and having an argument in my head, I will say to myself, this is taking up too much real estate in my head. So the question becomes, what did I do? Well, I love the Jersey Shore and I've always wanted to have a place down there. So instead of obsessing about work, I decorated in my head the entire beach house while I was driving. In my next life, I'm gonna be an interior designer. And it was beautiful. And after several days of decorating that house in my head, instead of having that mental fight, I was done being angry by the time I got to work. And this was one of the greatest lessons for me as a person and a caregiver. It pays not to live in your head. It doesn't do you or the other person any good at all. It truly, truly doesn't. DAPA, you can go to the next slide. So as DAPA said to you, the, the title of this is Caregiving Changes Relationships. And I talked about that a little bit in the beginning, but I wanna delve into this a little bit more, okay? Um, and I will also share with you that I wrote a book on this exact subject, how caregiving changes relationships, because I've been a caregiver for seven years. And for five of those years, I have written a blog for adult children of aging parents about caregiving issues. And there were about six blogs that really resonated with people who were reading them. And that's what the book is based on. And so when I say, what is a relationship? I think it about it as what are we willing or not willing to do for one another, okay? So as a caregiver, you know, I am not willing to go back to ShopRite twice in one weekend when I'm with, when I'm my mom's caregiver because it just eats away at every other thing I have to do. I am willing to do the things it does to keep her healthy physically. Right now we're at the tail end of, um, of, of a wound and thank God it's almost healed, but it's been too much of hands, two months of hands-on care for that wound. So knowing what you're willing or not willing to do for one another is, is what, what can change or you need to be aware of. Because if you can't take care of a wound, even as a caregiver, that's okay. And you get to look at other options like bringing a wound care nurse in, right? And sometimes as a caregiver, understanding what you're willing to not do allows you to set a boundary. The other way I define relationships is we show our love and support for one another in certain ways, right? Like my mom's a very social person. So part of the way I support her is helping her to, my mom's legally blind, make a phone call to a friend that she hasn't um, talked to in a while. She's having trouble dialing the phone number. You know, um, you know, uh, make sure that we go and visit family, at least when there's not a pandemic around. So we love and support one another in certain ways. Here's the thing, in caregiving, the way we do that is going to have to change as our loved one physically declines. So you need to figure out how to support one another and show that lover, love for one another in adapted ways. And then the other thing is what activities or social outlets bind your relationship together, right? Just like the way you show love and support, my mom loves to play cards, but her eyesight has gotten so bad that she really cannot. So we've had to change and modify the activities that we do together, okay? And even the social outlets. I wanna give you um, a, a, a quick story because how caregiving changes relationships um, and thinking about a relationship as kind of a contract and you can change those rules is not necessarily um, something that people say, oh yeah, that makes sense. So I'm going to give you an example of how your relationship is like a contract with these unwritten rules. And if you change them, the relationship changes. Husband and wife, one of them loses weight for health reasons. And all of a sudden, the way they interacted with one another, the fact that they went out to dinner three times a week and went to the movies and got popcorn and candy and soda together, right? 
changed because the person who lost weight was unwilling to do that because it put the weight risk, put the weight loss at risk. So now what bound that relationship together, social activities and support, one person has changed the rules of the game and they either have to adapt by talking about that or you run the risk of ruining the relationship. Dapa, if you can move to the next slide. So part of those rules and changing a relationship is we don't even recognize how many unspoken expectations there are in a relationship. And the first time I realized that when dad was in the hospital for those two weeks, November of 2014, my mother's unspoken expectation was that I could continue to care for her the same way my dad did, even though I was working full time and I had my own home. After all, it's normal for us to think that another person is going to do things exactly the way you would. We do it all the, we do it all the time when we make decisions or assumptions about how another person behaves or should behave based on our own biases. This came into play when I wanted to talk to mom about having a conversation if she got ill or was out her, uh, at the end of her life. And so it was a shock to me when my mother said to me, I trust you to know what I want. I was like, what? That unspoken expectation around what she wanted and the unspoken expectation that I would not talk about it with her was something that really took me by surprise. I don't know why it did, but it did, particularly after my dad died. But it's really only when we um, confront these unspoken expectations and have this intentional conversation that we can get beyond the anger, the hurt, the resentment that we can feel with our loved one. Dapa, you can go to the next slide. So I, I say this, um, the title is The Steps to Set Boundaries, but it's really the steps as well to having this thing called an intentional conversation. The first thing is you have to determine what needs to change. So for me, part of what needed to change was my mother's mindset that I knew what she wanted and was comfortable making decisions for her. And I also needed to change the fact that she was unwilling to have a conversation with me. And those were two huge emotionally laden changes that I was asking of my mother. And I recognized that, I truly did. But we also bring to this our own destructive patterns. And we have to um, actually recognize that to get beyond them. And it's only when we determine what needs to, to change and name it, and we identify our own destructive patterns and think through what can help us get beyond that we can have that intentional conversation. So let me just talk for a moment about um, that idea of a, uh, Dabba, if you would go to the next slide for me. Okay, so I wanna focus for just a moment on destructive patterns. And the interesting thing about this is they are so based in our family history, so based in our family history. And gender and birth order really do play a role in this, okay? So I'm the youngest daughter right? And I'm the, the I'm, I'm female and I'm the youngest. So depending upon your family history, having a different conversation or a difficult conversation can be heard very differently by your loved one from their oldest child or a son. So when you start to think about having a, a difficult conversation, an intentional conversation, and you know in your family history that because you're female or because they're your youngest, it won't be given as much weight. 
even if the other person is not a caregiver, then it becomes something that you may have to ask them to do or help you do. A lot of times we fear that if we force an issue, we're going we're gonna to bring up a rift in the relationship, particularly if we've had a difficult relationship in, in childhood. But I will tell you that as an adult to an adult, you have the right to initiate an, a difficult conversation. And here's where this starts. Don't parent your parent. Don't parent your spouse. And let me tell you, with some of the things we do as caregivers, it is way too easy to fall into a parental role, to have that parental tone of voice. And in doing so, you are not initiating an adult to an adult relationship was what is needed if you're gonna have these conversations. An adult to adult, you can deal with and talk about how difficult this is and let's not have this rip our relationship apart. And a lot of times we feel guilty, right? My mom wasn't, doesn't wanna have this conversation and forcing her to have that makes me feel bad about that, right? I don't, and, and the other thing is we're like, well, I don't want to have this conversation with them because I don't want them to feel like I want them to be ill or I want them to die. And then there's cultural things as well. There are cultures where having discussions about end of life is not something that they want to do. And then there's the emotions, both ours and the loved ones. This is a very emotional conversation. Yeah, but we've got some polls. Um, can you pull up, uh, go ahead and pull up one and two. We, I skipped over one and my apologies for that. Does everyone in your family feel comfortable with talking about what they want at end of life? Oh. If you guys would, Take a moment, we think we're gonna give you about 30 seconds for a quick yes or no. Okay. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. It is not a comfortable conversation. And for you guys that said yes, that's fantastic. When we get into the chat, I want to hear more about, you know, why you think that's true. Okay, thank you, Dapa. And let's go to the next poll as well, because I'm really curious um, what destructive patterns we bring to this. Oh, wow. It's the emotions. Wow. Okay. Thank you for your honesty in, uh, in sharing this with us. Okay. Okay. Super. Thank you. Okay. We can go to the next slide, Dapa. So, so this is my gift to you. I call it the drip method. And this is what I have learned about my mom. Getting my mother from a hard no to a yes is not a one and done conversation. It is multiple conversations. And let me tell you that this is going to be true of having the conversation of your life. It's not going to be one and done. You will have it several times. What I will tell you is Having it several times at different times and in different places is a really good strategy, okay? And when you are having these conversations, 
my mother needs to feel like she is still in control and I and I am sure your loved one does as well. And I've been using this drip method for the last seven years with my mom. And um, now she uses it on me, which is really kind of interesting to uh, um, tell you the truth. It really is. Okay, Dap, if you would go to the next slide. So I keep on using the term intentional conversation and I use the term hard and they're really one and the same. But this is what I've learned with my mom along with the, the drip method, okay? The first thing is you've got to name the change you need. Our loved ones are not mind readers, okay? And then you need to discuss that change, keeping these things in mind. The first is language. How often without thinking do we start a conversation with you must, you should, you need to, or the other non-starters, or you always, you never, you don't. Starting a conversation with you should fill out a DNR, you need to sit down and have a conversation with me about what you want if you get sick is all non-starters. It's just not the language we need to use. And, and, and with any age, but in particular, with our aging loved ones. There's a great book out there called How to Say It to Seniors, How to Close in the Communication Gap with Our Elders by David Soleil. And one of the things he talks about is that after age 70, two things happen with our elders. One is they're processing their legacy. And by that, I don't mean they're thinking who they're gonna give their money to. They're actually thinking about their life and coming to other conclusions. That's why you hear the reminiscing. Right. But the other thing that happens is they start to hold on to control tighter than ever before because they have already lost so much in terms of health and mobility and people in their world who are gone or are ill. So you when you have an intentional conversation, once you name it in your head, you need to sit down and plan it. And so you really need to start it with language that's an, a non-threatening eye comment or a question. So for example, I'm frightened that I won't know what is the best thing for you if you get seriously ill, right? It's on you. I'm frightened that I don't know what is the best thing I can do for you if you get seriously ill. Yes, we will be able to access the recording of this session. Yeah. Um, then part of that language is expressing a concern right away. I know it's difficult for you to have this discussion with me, but it deeply concerns me and I feel helpless, right? I feel helpless. Then a suggestion or open-ended question. You never want to say, will you talk about this with me? Because that's close-ended and if they say, no, you have nowhere to go, nowhere to negotiate. But rather, if you did an open-ended question, you know, I know it's difficult to have this conversation with me, but it deeply concerns me and I feel helpless. Would you rather talk about this with your physician or your minister? I'll reach out for you. Now you have a place to negotiate. Well, I'm not comfortable with my physician. I don't wanna to talk to the minister. Well, how about Kevin, who's my older brother? You know, and you, you're not gonna resolve it right then and there, but you've not gotten a hard no. You're in a place of negotiation. Time and place are also critically important. You know, if you're frustrated, the heat of the moment is not the right time. And, and if your loved one is upset or frustrated or just feeling down and overwhelmed, that's not the right time. And trust me, the right time can be dictated by the right place. Some of the best intentional conversations I've had with my mother is one of two places, the car because we're typically going someplace or, or often, not always to a doctor, we're going someplace fun and she's relaxed and looking forward to it. And it's quiet and we don't have to look in one another's eyes. The other is what I call really intimate motion um, um, moments. Like I cut my mom's hair 
And in that slow combing of her hair and moving it around to figure out where the best haircut, you know, is how to do it best. That intimate touch opens us up to conversations we couldn't have otherwise. You could just be sitting there holding your spouse's hand quietly, talking about the day, right? And then motivation. Let me say to you right now that this pandemic is probably one of the best motivators to have the conversation of your life with your loved one, because we are all very much aware of what can happen if you are diagnosed with this and have to go to the hospital. And so there's no better time than to have it right now. And I think you would be fine that your loved ones are motivated. Dap, if you'd go to the next side. You know, just some communication techniques, being honest and direct with one another. Too often as uh, someone bringing up an uncomfortable subject, we'll make excuses for our feelings and needs. You'll notice in that statement, I didn't say, I'm sorry, I'm feeling overwhelmed. I don't need to apologize for my feelings. I'm overwhelmed. We talked about not having it when you're angry. You know, we need to be careful, not only in the I statements, but are we judging them or blaming them? And I go back to my inner eight-year-old, right? It takes two to tango. What are you bringing to this conversation? And if it's not the right time and place, then don't have it. There will be other times and places. Dapa, if you'd go to the, the next slide. You know, we're, we're back again to words and tone matter, matter, being able to validate their feelings. Remember I said, I know this is difficult for you to have that conversation. That's a validation of their feeling and a concern for them. The other thing is they're gonna have boundaries, right? Respect that and work within that. Um, you know, maybe their boundary is that they, you can start the conversation, but they're uncomfortable talking about the real medical issues. So the next time it gets talked about is with their physician, right? Here's the thing. One of the things that can really be helpful if they're unwilling to talk to you is enlisting a peer or a voice of authority, right? A, a, a cousin, a friend, maybe someone who's just been ill and been ill in the hospital. What was that experience like? What do you wish you had done? Um, you know, a, a clergy member, all of that. We really, really need to recognize that even though we want the conversation and we want to know what they want, it may be best served by a peer or someone in the, that they view as an authority instigating it and having that conversation. So that brings me to, if you'll go to the next slide, how we got to where we are with mom. I, you know, one drip method, several times tried to have the conversation with my mother. It was no go, slow going, or we would have it and then she would, it just wasn't going anywhere. So I called my mother's primary care physician, who she loves, and asked her to start the conversation about the healthcare directive. And it was not a success. And I was really disappointed. My mother loves her primary and trusts him. And he had his social worker have the conversation with her and she did not know her. It was brief. She did not go into any kind of, she was very gentle with my mom, but she really didn't do what she needed to do. Um, and we brought the paperwork home and there it sat. It was my responsibility to get it signed and getting my mom off the mark uh, was hard. And this is really embarrassing to admit because I do this for a living. I couldn't get my mother to sign one. And then the pandemic hit and you couldn't get away from that awful news and the awful stories about people dying alone, let alone the medical interventions being done to keep them my mom. My mom and I never spoke about what you want about end of life, but we did talk about these stories and what was happening to people and what it felt like and what the families were going through. And then this January, my mother went into the hospital. And when the palliative nurse called and said, 
you don't have a health directive, do you? I was embarrassed to say no. I said no, and it's it's eating at me because I know we need to do it. She doesn't want to have the conversation. I said, you know, my real thing that I would really love to talk to her about is the pulse form. And she said, well, let me try. And my mother signed one. And I was so grateful, but so blown away by that. I think it was all the conversations that we had had up to that moment. I think it was the pandemic and my mother realizing that if she ever caught it, she wouldn't want the things being done to some of these older people they were doing. And it wasn't me having the conversation. It was another trusted authority. And in that conversation, the palliative nurse shared with me that my mother said to her, I'm 89. I have lived a good life. You know, I really, I don't need to be kept alive in all of these ways that we're able to do it now. And I will tell you that when the paperwork came back, because they mailed it to us, I opened it up and I said, oh, mom, we got the pulse form back. Thank you. Thank you for having this conversation and signing this document, because now I feel like I can really do for you what you want me to do. And it's such a relief. She said, mm -hmm. and that was the end of the conversation. One more slide, Dapa. So I will also, I can't end the story without, since we're talking about caregivers, so it's how important having what I call caregiver support peeps are around you. And these are the people that I go to when I need to vent, when I need to ask for help. And I say yes to help when they offer it. Some of these are my family of origin and some of these are my family of choice. And some of these are trusted advisors like that palliative care nurse that had the conversation with my mom that I could not. Keep these people close and strong um, and recognize that, you know, the older we get, the more important it is to keep them around us and find trusted authority voices who can be part of this support group. Dapa, next slide. So thank you for joining us today. We're going to spend the next 15 minutes or so in Q&A and talking about the polls. Um, I will tell you that all of the constructs that I talked about today, setting boundaries, unspoken expectations, how emotional it is, yada, 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 are in my book. It's an uh, ebook or hard copy. Feel free if you would like to order it out on Amazon. Um, I also have worksheets at the end of every chapter so you can think through those conversations and plan with them. I would love to help you in any way you can. That's my email address. Feel free to jot it down or my phone number and reach out to me. Um, and, but I, I'm like everybody else, if I don't know the number, I don't answer it. So leave a message, remind me how we met and I will be happy to, uh, to talk to you about anything about caregiving or about you know, how to structure that conversation of your life. You know, if you need to bounce it off somebody, um, it would be a pleasure to do that. Okay, DAPA. We can open it up to questions. So first of all, I just want to say thank you for those wonderful stories and all of that information. And before I open it up for audience questions, I just wanted to give a quick reminder that this webinar will be available on the COIL webpage later this afternoon so that you can review the information that you may have missed and you can share it with your family members and friends. And we also have other resources available for you too, such as our advanced care planning, preparing for the one preparing for the unexpected one pager, where we've compiled trusted resources that are all accessible from home to help you and your loved ones start thinking about your wishes and strategies for how you can comfortably approach these important conversations with one another and your healthcare providers. We encourage you to take a look at this document and share it with your family and your friends and stay tuned because COIL will continue to push out resources such as one pagers and webinars like this one, this one today for residents and healthcare providers. So I want to open up the floor to audience questions and you can type in your questions in the Q&A box or in the chat box. And while we're waiting for everyone to 
answer their questions. I do kind of want to revisit some of the communications techniques that you had mentioned. So I just wanted to ask, is there ever a bad way to start this conversation for those of us who may have missed it? The bad way to start the conversation is, is using those non-starter like you should, you must, you always, or um, I, I need to, you know, it's, it's, um, it's making the onus on them and that's going to take away their control and that's going to put somebody's back up. So, you know, the idea of, of making it an I, I'm overwhelmed at the thought of I, what I don't know. And then also just clearly recognizing what their concerns may be. I know it's difficult for you to have these conversations, but it's really important to me so I can do what you need to do. And then never ending it with a, you know, a, a question that they can say no to, but instead saying um, an idea of, uh, you know, what would what would be better for you talking to your minister or talking to um, uh, you know a, a, a cousin or or your physician so yeah thank you and just sticking on the topic of these conversations what are some strategies that you found that work for advanced care planning and end-of-life conversations on top of the drip method well, I, you know, I, there are times when I um, talk to my mom about it would be, for example, if one of her friends had passed, right, or a family member, and just talking about, you know, what was that experience like, you know, were, were they in the hospital, you know, what life-saving measures, and then saying, well, you know, is that something that, that you would want to do, you know, have you thought about that at all, Um you know, and that you may or may not get very far with that, um, but you you always take the conversation, you know, including sometimes it's hard when it's a loved one, but like if if um, an actor were to die, right, or something were to be in an accident, like oh my gosh, wow, that's really, you know, they're going to have a long recovery time. I hope they can. You know, just taking moments where something bubbles to the top and ha and starting that conversation. And we do have a question from the audience. How do you have the hard conversations to engage siblings in caretaking responsibilities? Oof, yeah, wow. That's like the million dollar conversation. <laughs> it really, really is. Um, you know, I think, I think part of it is thinking through really being honest and thinking through family dynamics, right? And it's not just the family dynamics between you and your siblings, but it's also the family dynamics between your siblings and the person that they would have to partake in the caretaking responsibilities. Um, I'm gonna be perfectly honest and say, my, I have an older brother, um, and I always knew I was going to be the caretaker because I'm the youngest daughter, yada, yada, yada. But also, particularly with my mom, my brother's relationship with my mom is, was difficult, was difficult. And so I knew it was going to be harder for him to do some of the caregiving things. So I had to think clearly about what could he do to help me. Now, my brother during these six years moved 12 hours away and he's not in great health. So for me, that kind of took it. But, but what we came to is my brother calls my mom every day, right? To just chat and make sure she's okay because she's social and she needs that. And that helps me. He also pays to have the lawn at, uh, mowed and the snow taken care of, which means I don't have to do it for my mother's house and mine. So being able to do that, him doing that takes off that. Um, because he's 12 hours away, uh, we don't, I can't even really ask him to do the, uh, to come up and do the, the physical stuff because he's 12 hours away and not in great health. So I would say the first thing I need, I would like you to think about is not just the relationship between you and your siblings, but the relationship between your, your sibling and, and the person they need to care for and, and what can they do for them that doesn't cross a boundary for them. Um, I'll, I'll share one other story. I was working with a client 
and he really wanted his mom to um, go into assisted living, but he wanted her to go to one because he thought it was better than the other. And his sister, who did most of the caregiving, didn't want her to go there, it was too far. And when he really kept saying, how can I convince her to do that? I said to him, okay, you can, you can convince her to do that. But if she comes back to you with, and sets a boundary that says, mom's too far away, I can't be there every day, are you willing to pick up the slack? And that was an aha moment for him because he hadn't thought about, well, she's doing it already. So she's just going to continue. So kind of being able to help them see and set a boundary that says, I cannot think about what you can and can't do, both physically and emotionally. And then think about how you can set a boundary. I can no longer take mom to the doctor once a week. I know it's hard for you to do that. Would be something that, you know, and then think about how, what's, how can you get from a yes to no, right? Can, can you, you know, would you be willing to pay for an Uber once a week to do that? Because I cannot physically do it. So it's, it's thinking about, it's first of all, not having the fight in your head. Kim, I know you said yes to that. Not having the fight in your head getting rid of the inner, inner eight-year-old and thinking about where you can set boundaries. And one final thing about this, and I truly do mean this. I use the term family of origin versus family of choice. I think as caregivers, we bring our own family dynamics to this caregiving experience. And we, because of that need or want our siblings to be a part of this. And sometimes for whatever reason, they simply cannot be. And so for whatever reason, your family of choice can't be, or I'm sorry, your family of origin can't be, then who can you go to who's your family of choice? Your friend, a cousin that you're close to, um, whatever it is that isn't necessarily your family of origin, and maybe share the caretaking responsibilities for them and letting go of the fact that it must be the family. Sometimes the family isn't an option for a variety of reasons. And you know what? That's kind of okay. It really, really is. Thank you for that. So yes, thank you, Deb, for all of that helpful information. And I just wanted to warn everyone about session three of our COIL April Caregiver Series that's coming up next Wednesday, April 21st at 12 p.m. We will have subject matter expert Robin Cohn, the Director of Programs and Services at the Alzheimer's Association of New Jersey presenting on living with Alzheimer's for caregivers. So this was session two, three, which was wonderful. So thank you again, Deborah. And so if you have any questions after today's presentation, please feel free to reach me at dwilcox at njhcqi.org. Sorry, that backwards right there. And thank you all again for joining us. And I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks for joining. And thanks for asking me to participate in the series, DAPA. It was, it was wonderful. It was a pleasure to have you back. Thank you very much.